everyone. Welcome to our very first uh, Parasite Pay student visit. Uh, I'm Angie, I'm the Curator of Education and Public Programs in Parasite. And this is my co-worker, uh, Chu Chang. She's the Curator oh. of Parasite. So um, I'm giving a brief intro of the, the whole initiative. We just started this, uh, this month and in the following uh, three, four months, I think, we're going to visit uh, more than 50, 60 um, emerging yeah. artists. The list in is Hong growing. Kong. Yes, we're building the list. Um, so we hope to, you know, through this program, we can invite um, our emerging artists in Hong Kong to share their work um, through this, um, you know, through our online community and people, no matter you're a curator, your artist, or simply art lover can, uh, you know, uh, enjoy the works and have this chance to participate in all these virtual student visits, ask questions, and uh, hopefully, um, have a great experience uh, with the artists together. So tonight, our uh, staff uh, lead will be Chu Chang, and Chu Chang will uh, spend the next hour with our very first um, artist, Enoch Chen, who is currently in New York City right now. Um, and uh, let's welcome both. All right. Um, thank you, Enoch, for joining us from, from New York. And um, everyone who's joining this um, online studio visit, welcome. And um, although I'm playing a lead, leading role here, um, there's really no moderator and really no a, a leading figure. So if you have any question, any thoughts that you want to express, please feel free to unmute yourself, post question to Enoch, and then but please remember to mute yourself after you speak so that we can have a ideal audio quality in regards to everyone's experience. So thank you so much. Um, so Enoch, hi. It's Hello, good morning. And evening from Hong Kong. <laughs> um, how are you doing recently? I know that you're doing a residency in New York. How's the experience and how are you doing with the current lockdown? Um, the experience in the beginning was incredible. I had the residency fellowship at the American Museum of Natural History. And I was so, so impressed because it, it's a museum with, of course, natural history, but they are also famous for anthropology. So I felt like I stepped into a world of many worlds and I was very intimidated. So I had to learned um, very quickly. And I, I even took a course on evolution in the beginning. And then um, by the time I began to think that, oh, perhaps I could start to ask some questions now. And then there was a lockdown. Um, so the museum is of course um, closed. Um, and I think from the other side of the world, you might have seen the number was very scary, right? So it was on the rise. Um, so, but it wasn't unexpected um, for me because um, coming from Hong Kong, um, having, having the experience of SARS or even now looking at the COVID-19 in a distance, I would have, uh, I guessed, I would have guessed that there was no way that, that the America was not part of it, right? Because of the globalization and all that. So I was watching how, how the city was changing from people not wearing masks to everyone wearing masks and, and um, how people are staying at home, including myself and um, self quarantine experience different things. So I've been inside most of the time Sometimes I do go out for groceries and also for for taking a walk in the park. Um, so and the city is slowly slowly opening. We'll see what's going to happen in the coming one or two weeks. How long have you been in New York? Um, since last year on the twenty ninth of December. Oh, so. Yeah already almost half a year yeah almost half a year so now not being able to be in the museum physically um is there any way for you to continue your research i mean it's not ideal because um 
because I wasn't there um, to see the works. But I mean, most of the things I have to do is, um, is the reading. I have to read a lot, actually, trying to catch up. And also my colleagues are incredible. I mean, we still talk um, from time to time, also kind of like this or with Skype. So in the research part, I am getting some work done. Yeah, so hopefully when they open, I can go back and look at the collection. Yeah. Enoch, I want to ask you to introduce yourself a little bit because um, we know each other for quite a long time. Last time we chat and we realized that we, we knew each other since 2014, yeah. somewhere around seven, that. Seven, eight years, yeah. When you were working as the um, public education person at AA, you came to Shenzhen when I was working at when I was working at OCAD, and you did a talk there. So I always remember you as a um, educator slash curator. But then you went on to study writing, and then you became an artist and a performance based artist. So there's a lot of changes happening to you. So could you walk us through your experience? Yeah, so like you have said, I used to work at Asia Arts Archive as the programs manager. So I organized a lot of public events, exhibitions, and then I went to London um, to study at Goldsmiths. At the English department, I did um, creative writing mm -hmm. for my master. Then uh, fast forward, I, I, when I returned to artist, um, one day I bumped into a curator in Hong Kong called Yuan Yuan, and she asked me whether I wanted to do something at her new space. And then there was a point of no return. I became an artist. Um, I was um, making a film installation in her space. Um, so I, I work with, I work with um, different media, film installation, performance, um, also curating. I see curating as my artistic practice and also fashion, different kinds of things, depending on what I, I'm supposed to, to think about, to talk about, and I find the medium to come out, um, the, the ideas. Um, I think we should start by looking at one of your works so that we can get an idea and get the conversation going. Um, so due to um, Enoch's internet condition, uh, we thought it might be for me to play some of his videos and images on my site. So Enoch share, has already shared some of his video links with me. Uh, we're going to play a new video piece, right? It's um, your most recent one. It's a short one. It's only around four minutes. So let's go to the video first and then we can come back and continue the conversation. I'll do a share screen.
Okay, coming back. Um, you know, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Great. Um, so could you tell us about this video? Because um, I've watched several of your earlier videos and zebra is definitely a reoccurring theme. And you mentioned about South Africa a lot as well. So could you um, talk more about that? Yeah, so this work is currently shown um, in Hong Kong at the end of this month, I think, um, at a gallery called the Karen Weber Gallery. So if possible, please go and see it um, for the better sound um, system and, and playing. And also it's a part of an installation. So supposedly the work is um, projected onto a screen made with silk um, with um, African um, African icons and, and imagery. So, so yes, um, it's about zebra. Um, it's about zebra that it's called the quaha. It's one of the subspecies of the zebra family. So actually this one, this is the zebra on my, yeah. So, so in the past few years, I've been searching for the zebra because um, um, they are actually, unique in South Africa. They were unique in South Africa and they were sent to a lot of um, European countries in the 18th, 19th century. But um, in the late 1800, um, 1894, I believe, the last one died in Amsterdam and no one knew about it. So that's um, part of their story. They have gone extinct. And then 20 years ago, um, the scientists have managed to bring it back um, so they so they claim um, they they brought it back through selective breeding, and it's very interesting that they find the the cousin species of of this um, zebra, and then they put them together and have them to breed, and then if they have too much stripes, they breed again, they breed again, and then um, until they have um, only stripe on the upper body because this particular um, quaha um, used to only have um, stripes on the upper body. So I was fascinated by this idea about this animal, um, not only because of, of how they have gone extinct and they managed to come back um, in terms of um, colonization. Um, they were sent to, to Europe and then they disappeared and then um, the South African managed to bring it back. Um, they had to go through this boat journey um, to, from, from South Africa to, to Europe, like the Noah Ark story. 
So I was fascinated by how these stories are told. Um, but at the same time, I have a family history in South Africa. My grandfather was an illegal immigrant from Hong Kong to South Africa. So he had to hide on a boat in 1964. And, and then he had to go through the sea for like several weeks to South Africa. Um, I was thinking he must be crazy. Yeah, going through such a long journey. Um, so I've been thinking about that. I still have a big family. My mother's size family, it's all there, more or less. Um, so they have experienced different part of history, um, including the, the apartheid history. And till now, till today, to the COVID-19. So, so I'm interested in, in how my grandfather went through this journey and now they're the third generation of, of the family now. So they have also been reinventing the story of their identity. Yeah, so I've been thinking about this. And in the past few years, I have been fascinated by, by again, another story of the natural history, how natural history have been told um, through, through, of course, the Noah Ark. Yeah, so if you go to some natural history museum, you would um, sometimes see they line the animals from, from the small one to the large one, kind of like the archetype of story um, through the Noah Ark. So I've been making works about that in terms of how story have been told um, through different tradition, be it natural history, be it science history, be it um, national history, soci socio-political or personal history. I'm well, really curious about your family history. So when did your uh, grandfather start this migration from Hong Kong to um, Africa and why South Africa at that time? <laughs> this is a crazy story. Um, so he went in 1964, actually. Um, so in the 60s, actually, um, it's, it's crazy. People would go to America, right, for gold digging. I would think, why, why would he go to South Africa? And apparently, according to the family history, is that he used to be a parallel trader, what we call parallel trader. He would bring goods from Hong Kong and pass the border to China um, to sell, sell them to relatives and friends in, in his village. And then one day, according to the story, he was kidnapped. And then he was made to swallow a pill and then he has like running stomach and then he had to come to Hong Kong to bring money back to, to look for the, for, the, for the cure, whatever. And then he was so scared, he has been followed uh, all along. So they had a record of him going back to China and then they knew the family men, members and all that. Um, and then he went back to Hong Kong and he never, never um, dared to go back to China. And, and then there was a typhoon in, in Hong Kong and the economy was very bad. And my grandmother had uh, some family members in South Africa. They were running the, the um, butcher wholesale business, I think. And then he borrowed a lot of money, like 10,000 Hong Kong dollars in the 60s. I don't know how it happened. Um, so he borrowed money and then he bought on a boat to go to South Africa. And then slowly he brought his sons and daughter to South Africa one by one. And we were the last family to go in 1997. I'm sorry, 1995. So we all moved to South Africa. Obviously a lot of people were moving back then because of the handover. And we were one of them. Um, and then we went there for two years. My mother passed away in South Africa and then we went back to Hong Kong just to see the handover. Yeah, so that's more or less the family history till now. And 20 years ago. Um, second question about the video. So there are a lot of very specific scenes like uh, we saw a prison kind of set up, but that's probably not a prison because you mentioned Noah, Noah's Ark, so 
probably that's like in a cargo ship, I, my, my guess. And also you see this African grassland. Um, so where did you collect your footage? And is there um, a very intentional um, arrangement in terms of um, juxtapositioning all these footages? Um, yeah, I mean, the footage is, um, some, most of them you saw, like you said, the, the, the nature is from South Africa. It's where the, the f one of the first farms that, um, that um, took part the, in the project of, of breeding these um, quaha, the zebra. So this is the fifth generation, fifth or sixth generation. So I went to see them um, in the wild. And then the, the prison you saw was actually where they locked up um, Mandela. So I went to this island to see. So I had to also take a boat to go to see this um, famous prison that they kept um, Mandela. And then other parts were taken from different places. Like you see all these kind of like fresh flashing light. It was when I was clubbing in Taiwan. <laughs> so, and then I was like, oh, filming at, this, at the same time. It, it was fascinating, so I, I decided to film. And then the hand uh, with the with a sewing machine was um, taken in Thailand with my tailor, where he was making my clothes and also some of the um, installation that I was making. So I was actually layering different kinds of footages actually with um, the, the history of Mandela, of course, and also this, um, this history of, of, um, of the South African zebra history. And also with this idea of weaving, like sewing, yeah, and, and then with, with this light and music, um, sound and all that. So I put them together basically um, just to position different kinds of visual elements yeah, but then to tell a story, it's almost like a dream-like story um, to talk about identity. Yeah, speaking about dream-like, uh, I mean, the way that the video are grouped together feel very dispersed, um, which also play into this kind of dream-like feeling as well. But um, I was wondering, um, how, how did you um, decide on this type of narrative and how does this form of narrative play into your like, line of thoughts? How, how does it reveal what you are researching um, in an efficient way to you? Um, first of all, I, I find the idea of identity is a very um, interesting one because um, we are, we are not just one thing, we always um, adopt different kinds of stories to tell our, we identify with different stories to construct our identity. So it's, um, it's kind of like the reconstruction over and over again, like in our dream, uh, we pick up different kinds of memory, we mix it up. So that, that's one, 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 one approach how I think about these things when I make these films. And then I was also highly influenced by, um, by, by um, this famous, famous um, Iranian film director called Abbas Kiristami. And then I met him in person when he came to Hong Kong. I looked after him for four days. Um, and then one day I asked him, hey, I know this famous film that you made with only five shots. I will, I will go and see it. Um, with with a projector at home, and then you say, okay, make sure you you watch it with good sound system, and take a nap in the middle. I said, I asked while watching your film. He said, yeah, sure, you will get more. And I find find this approach very liberating, and also um, very generous. Um, you just put things together through very careful deliberate construction, but then you pass on the, the narrative to the audience so that they can also have their own experience. Um, knowing for the fact that um, people will see this film in the gallery in a loop, so they may enter, enter at one minute or two minutes, and then they may see maybe 
one minute of it or 10 seconds of it or the whole film in a loop. Um, I find it also um, a very interesting way of viewing films in, in an open space without, without the confinement of, of the seats like, like in the cinema. Um, so that's why I feel I should open up the narrative even more with this kind of um, process of filmmaking. Yeah. But of course, I, I, before I worked on films like this as an artist, I used to make film like a narrative with two people talking, falling in love and all that. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm very much aware dif um, of, of different modes of viewing. Yeah, and I find um, the way we make films in, in art gallery as an exhibition, um, a very different way of, of understanding story. Mm. I, I asked about this because um, most of your recent video works are using this kind of narrative, like very dispersed uh, video clips collected from um, your traveling or your residency experience in different places and put together in a very loose form and then there are text and that sort of lure you into a very tranced state. Um, I also watched your tr trilogy on migration. Could you tell us more about that? Because I thought that was, um, that trilogy is very much linked with the, the zebra story as well. And while you are um, talking about the works, I can also show some of the clips or um, images of your work. Sure. Um, so I did a trilogy on, on um, the idea of migration and extinction. Um, in the beginning, I didn't know what I was working on actually. But then one day I was reading a book about uh, a short story and I was very fascinated by, by this particular animal called the axolotl. Um, and it, it's actually, it's about aquarium, an aquarium in Paris where they kept this axolotl. So I went to see this axolotl in, in Paris and started filming also. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just filming because it was fascinating. And then it took me a long, long time until I, I decided, oh, it's time to work on this because I saw this um, axolotl um, as our ancestor. Um, there is a myth in Hong Kong called Long Teng. So we, we, we have this myth about Hong Kong identity being uh, a mermaid, basically half fish and half um, human, except that it's the fish head and then the human leg. So I be began to work on this idea about, about mythology. And then when I was working on it, the way, the way I work is like this. I, I would film a lot without knowing. And now I have my iPhone, it's even, even worse. So I'm constantly filming whenever, whenever, I had the hunch that I had to capture something. And then I, didn't, I wouldn't know how I would use it until there is enough impulse or there is a moment I, I thought, okay, something is going on now. So I, I would sit down and then merge these um, footages, um, footages together. So when I was working on the first one, I realized, oh, there is more than that. So I decided to work on a trilogy, I decided to use three, three films to talk about these stories about migration and extinction, linking different um, stories from the natural histories, as well as some my grandfather stories. Um, it is not particularly about my grandfather per se, but it's about how stories are told. So I made these kind of films in, in in this format um, with film and installation. So, so what we are looking at now, it's, it's a single screen, but if you come to the exhibition, usually there might be three to seven to eight screens on now. Sometimes it's projected on different things. Yeah, so this is kind of the evolution, the evolution of, of um, how these stories um, came about. Although I, um, in my can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do want you to elaborate more on this idea of 
identity because you when you mention identity you also talk about extinction and it can very immediately link link people to this idea of um oppressed culture and oppressed community facing the extinction of uh, including culture and language and, and their own land even um, and it makes this very direct and very simple connection although I, I think when you were talking about identity it became something that is much more complex um, so I do want you to talk more about that yeah I find also the idea of extinction very very um, interesting in a way that um, Extinction is also a, an idea for you to think about zero, the absolute zero. Um, how can you prove extinction? You have to prove this, this particular species um, does not exist anymore. Um, by doing so, you, you, you have to go through a journey of understanding a what what is that species that we're looking at but at the same time you also have to kind of keep track of okay how many of them left on earth and they're gone now and in this vast earth what what the the, the earth um so so i found this idea of kind of like beyond our logical thinking but it's very logical you see um, so, so that's why I, I feel how we construct our identity collectively. How do we see our identity individually? How, 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 how I view myself as someone from Hong Kong and how I see myself being part of Hong Kong and who is also looking at us and how are we looking at ourselves? Um, it, it's, it's actually very, it, it's, a, it's, the, it's a story that we constantly tell ourselves, but I also find it's a story that is very hard to grasp, you know, very hard to understand and comprehend. Kind of reminds me of the zebra story that you told us earlier. So it went extinction, but then it was brought back um in a similar but slightly different form so i mean identity is constantly in changing um it's like a compound of idea that it's constantly having new things joining in and then maybe old things dying out um which is a very interesting idea because um looking at your trilo trilogy um there's in, in the narrative there's always like multiple subjects um you always talk in in terms of in terms of i but this i sometimes is referring to your ancestor and then sometimes it's referring to an animal um or something that it's even more abstract i i do want to show more video but um uh, do you think um we should do that or should we move on to your performance piece i'm a bit hesitant Depending on time how 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 are we looking at time Maybe we can go with the performance first, and then um, if needed, we can show um, sure. something up. Because this performance is related to, to those um, videos that we were talking about. Yeah. A following question would be, how does all these um, discussions in terms of identity and migration can link to um, another side of your practices, which is um you as a choreographer and a performer um you also share the video with me which we can watch together we have a c3 stylized body okay have a, any formula now i teach you formula for a riding horse riding horse okay okay uh it is a whole stick, whole stick. can you see this means now have a real horse on stage mm. okay so use imagination imagination okay, okay. 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 <laughs> first push hold yes. 
police. First, left leg and right leg and sit. Okay, now we sit on the horse. Then we can ride. And do some performance. Ooh. Ooh. So scared because uh, there has obstacle, obstacle, and okay. horse scared and fall. Ooh. Ooh. Try to get up. Uh, sit. Uh, count three. One, One two, two, eight. Then we can try pass. Use some technical. Technical. Okay. Okay. Hit horse. Eight. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Go. And we pass. Ah, okay. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. Then we see the destination. Destination. Okay. I see. Then we pause. Do some uh, hands and pause. Finish. Finish. Ah, okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay. You understand? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, understand. Then we do again. Again? Okay. But okay. don't say anything. But in silence. In silence. So, so. Yeah. Okay. Then Yes, I mean, yes, you do better more than you know. <laughs> better. <laughs> Very better, right? Thank you, thank you. Of uh, course, of course, of course. I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, why Enoch want to be a horse? Um, because Enoch thinks that his grandfather has incarnated into a horse. Oh? Yes, actually, a zebra. Uh, uh, Enoch has told me the story before. Mm. So in South Africa, we have a zebra called the Quaha. Quaha? Yes, Quaha. Quaha. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so now in the 19th century, the Europeans like to bring them to their homes. Yeah. yeah. So the zebras have to go through a long trip in a cabin on the boat through the ocean. The last South African zebra has gone extinct in Amsterdam. But 20 years ago, scientists have managed to bring them back through selective breeding. So in the past few years, Enoch has managed to go to different natural history museums to look at the quaka taxidermies. And every time he looked at them, you could hear the voices from these quaka taxidermies. Something that the old quaka would hear on the boat journey across the ocean. And this is the same exact warning that his grandfather used to hear in his sleep. If If anything, if anything happens, 
if anything happens, we. If anything happens, we will. If anything happens, we will draw. If anything happens, we will draw you. If anything happens, we will draw you into. If anything happens, we will draw you into the. If anything happens, we will draw you into the water. Okay. Uh... So this is an excerpt of a performance. Could you tell us more about this whole, the whole play? Um, so the show, it's, um, the show was taking part in Tycoon in Hong Kong last year. So I've been working on this um, idea of migration and extinction and also different kinds of stories and mythology as a trilogy, as we were just talking about, right? And then one day I, I just thought, okay, there are so many ideas. So I had to put them together in, in some order now with different kinds of fragments. So I started with a lecture performance um, just to talk about these things in a format that, that I had to talk about through a linear time. And then it slowly, it was growing into, into a, a performance um, in a theater setting. Because at the same time, I was also interested in um, Cantonese opera and Chinese opera, um, Sichu in this case. Um, I was very interested in how they use their body to, to embody, to personalize um, different kinds of um, forms and animal with what they call the, the, the technique, the, the format is what they call. So with different kinds of setting, when you see a horse stick, you know there's a horse to, to represent that. Um, so, so they really embody the, the story physically with a set of tradition. So I was very interested in this case. Um, so I began to look into that and I went to South Africa um, to, to think about this um, performance. And then I saw this performer in South Africa. So I took him to, to Hong Kong with this um, performer from Taiwan who was actually experiment, experimenting with different forms of um, Sichu performances and then put them together to tell these stories. Um, where I started with this idea with, um, because in the past three years, I've been going to different museums in, um, in Europe to look at the, the um, taxidermy of this quokka. So, so I would pay to, to look at this one, to go to, to Vienna, to look for, to, to ask them to take it out for me to see it. Um, so I've been looking at them. And then I had this idea that um, maybe my grandfather, my, my grandfather has passed away. So, so I was thinking, okay, maybe he has incarnated into this kwaha. Because incarnation is another kind of story that we Chinese tell ourselves how, how, about how things return, how things are coming back with a new identity with the old. So I was thinking about this idea. And then with this idea how, how my grandfather would be going through the journey, through the water. And, and actually he was, he was warned, he was told um, that you have to hide. If anything happens, we'll throw you in, into the water. So he was, constantly, he was constantly living in fear. Just like all these animals when they had to go through this journey, yeah. Or, or, or the slaves who had to go through the journey through the sea from Africa to, to America, to different places. 
yeah, so I was trying to think about this to, to think about how, how we talk about these stories and how we, how we deal with fear. Several follow-up questions regarding the theater setting that we just saw. Um, I'll ask them all at once and you can uh, talk about them one by one. So first I realized that the audience members are wearing headsets. So what kind of sound experience are they experiencing at the Taekwon Theater? And then also um, the costume is very interesting and you also mentioned that you consider fashion as part of your artistic practice as well. So could you talk more about what they are wearing? And then the African dancer, is he a contemporary dancer or is he um, someone who works in the more traditional performance form? Yeah, um, let's go with the last question. It's, it's easier. Um, he is actually a, a very well-trained contemporary dancer, um, but he has never done something like this before um, to work with a CG performer or to work with a contemporary artist. Um, so it was actually not easy for him because in, in um, the, the convention of contemporary dance training, it's uh, very much, uh, it's about improvisation or freedom of expression or, or like five, or the other stream would be like five, six, seven, A, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, A, and then they follow this kind of um, repetition of, of choreography, right? But of course, I'm generalizing choreography, but, but you get the idea. He was actually very trained in, in such a way to think about the body, which is also very interesting to, to think about how we embody ideas. Um, so I decided to, to work with him and then he was actually very fascinated by this project where he had to talk. Yeah, because as dancer, usually you're on stage dancing and moving and express with your body, but, but very rarely you talk and, and to tell story and to embody a story with also his identity there. So that's one. Oh, and then about the, the headset. Um, yes, actually, I have been actually very fascinated uh, with this idea about sound and also with uh, headphones. Um, so I have actually been working, I have actually worked on several projects about um, using the headphone, like a radio show, but then they walk around. Last year I did a show about the, the um, epidemic history in Hong Kong from the 1800 to 2003 to SARS. Um, so I was weaving different kinds of story together with music by Leslie Chung and Anita Mui. So, so they were going through um, the pop music story also weave through different kinds of um, epidemic histories in Hong Kong. So, so in the theater, usually you would watch um, a show in front of you and photo in front of you with your naked eyes and your naked ears, right? But but then I treated the show all also like a radio show. So sometimes people don't see the performance on stage. They would just see the space in dark, for example. So they had to listen and there's some music going on. But at the same time, um, oftentimes when we see a dance performance, you don't hear the breathing. And you see the costume and then with the necklace and all that, you, you hear everything from this person. Mm -hmm. So you're also very close to the stage. And also the way people are listening to something with a headphone, they're being told something, right? So they listen. But they always have an option to take it out. And I find this, this is an option that they could, they could have. But of course, most of the time, if the story is, intrig uh, is intriguing enough, you will stay on with the headphone, right? And, and I had to make sure the narrative is strong enough so that they wouldn't take it out. Um, so, so this is also uh, a way for me to think about um, how to engage with the audience. Um, because um, theater is a very different kind of space then, then uh, or radio show, it's an also very different kind of um, experience and medium. 
you have to make sure people follow, follow through the journey with you. So it's a very different kinds of setting and also very different kinds of practice. And oh, also uh, you were talking about clothes. Yeah, so um, because in theater, you have to also think about what they are wearing, right? Everything they wear, it, it's part of something. So, so I, when I work with performers, um, not only in theater, even sometimes when I work in, in gallery space, I have to care about what they, they're wearing because they have to bring their, their own clothes or have to get them clothes, right? So, so in the past few years, I have been shopping and going to different places until I went to South Africa to look at um, different kinds of fabric. And then they have this long tradition of wax print kind of um, it, uh, kind of also a long colonial history about how how prints and icons and iconographies and also color came about as a tool for them to express their identity so i started with looking at fabric in in south africa and then i had a, for some reason it's uh, magical reasons that I went to Senegal with another artist, uh, Ming Wong, and then I was like blown away because there's so many, so many markets to look at fabric. And then I made a lot of clothes. I, I think I made more than twenty items within one week. So um, I find actually the 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 process of making clothes very interesting because you cannot be random, right? The clothes have to be worn. So you have to be very precise. Uh, what goes first, what, where, and, and how. Um, it's very important. Um, so this actually demands another kind of um, thinking, also narrating and putting things together. Yeah, so I'm beginning to go in this journey now um, of making clothes that I wear and also my, my friends are wearing my clothes now. I'm wondering if you're designing your own pattern in terms of when you are making clothes or do you collect um, different ready-made textiles from different places and put them together, creating a kind of a collage? Yeah, um, so now I'm printing something that I make, but actually, ideally, I wish I can print something on my own, but it's very, very expensive actually to print. Um, last year, I also did a tour for, for the Hong Kong Cultural Center where I decided to make a scarf. So I had to go all the way to Thailand to find a silk screen printer who is willing to print for me with a small, small bulk. I, I printed a thousand of them and then they almost turned down my business because it's, it's, it's not enough. <laughs> People would print like 10,000 for, for them to operate in, in in such a way you have to you have to have certain number so so most of the time i i wouldn't be able to print exactly what i would like to print but um but then actually going through um different markets um if i if i am in hong kong uh when i have time i will always go to sham shui po to look at fabrics to look at if like for example this yellow stripe that is something I'm, I'm also very, very fascinated by. It's very, very difficult to find. And how stripes are laid out, like the zebra, it's very precise. So once you go into just this idea about stripes, you, you can go crazy. Um, and then I, I also went to the largest market in China, in Guangzhou, to look at fabric. And, and you just blown away by, by how you, have the possibility to select yeah so so hopefully one day i can i can do something with my own printing but it's another kind of business that it's crazy <laughs> um we've been chatting for an hour already so i want to encourage the rest of our visitors here to ask questions or if you want us to show you more videos from Enoch, you can feel free to let us know and we can show you more things. So guys, what do you say?
We have also some images about other performances, right? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, we also did. And yeah, so sometimes I, I work in a gallery space for film, but then I also work um, in a gallery space in terms of um, performances. Um, because they, the audience will see performance very differently than in the theater. So they're in an open space. So I work a lot on one-on-one -on -one performances um, in a theater, I'm uh, sorry, in a gallery. So this one, it's about the, um, the contagious history of SARS in mm -hmm. Hong Kong, um, where the performer would, would come to you and, and to talk to you. So this was actually a workshop that they were doing. Yeah, so where they, where they have to come close and then they share a story, an intimate story about the um, history of illness and the fear of illnesses. Yeah. And the way they touch each other, is this based on your instruction or is this something that they... Yeah, so when you work on choreography, you always need a score precisely uh, when do they do certain things and, and how do they respond. So this is the pulse, right? Mm. Yeah, you, you see in movie when you cut the neck and then blood will come out. So this is a pulse. Yeah, so, so they have to touch. And this one, it's, um, it's another performance about um, the nature. So the performer would identify an audience in, in, the, in the gallery. And then they will project a sound to, to that particular audience. And if that audience responds, the audience will come to them and to introduce them about the exhibition. And while they're doing so, um, they will also tell a story about a microorganism, how they move. And then they will ask the audience how they also move. So the audience would all out of the blue, right? How I move. So they will be start, um, the audience would then start to move, right? So then the, the, um, the performer will pick up the story of the microorganism, how they move, and also how the audience move, and then they will combine it together. And then they will dance in front of this particular audience in the space. So for the audience outside, you would also see these two people working together in this audience. So one audience will be watching this performer dancing for him or her. And this work is also shown in an exhibition that you curated, right? Yeah. So this is an exhibition in um, K11 Chi Art Space. And um, this exhibition is about the movement of nature. Because in the gallery space, um, I, I see the gallery space also like a greenhouse in, in a garden, for example. But of course, it's First, it's very expensive to show plants in, in the gallery space. And also, um, in, in, it, um, I was also thinking about the movement itself, how, how, how plants or how organisms would move. So we, we had different works by different artists um, to, to work on this idea about movement inspired by um, the nature. Mm. Let's go see your performance piece at other scenarios. For example, at theater, I guess we can see images from the tycoon performance that we were talking about. Yeah. So this one, you see the audience would also have to move. They also have to migrate from one space to it to another with, with the performer. So they were making waves, yeah. And then this one, it, it, uh, it's about me trying to imitate and to embody the movement of, of this performer 
with um, this Cantonese opera Long Sleeves. Last and time, this, sorry, you continue. Yeah, and this is a performance that I did with the uh, um, CCDC um, in Hong Kong. Um, so this show, um, it's 70 minutes long, 70 minutes long. And then we have um, five sections. And, and when the audience come, they would um, select the order of the five sections. So each night the performance order will be different. But then at the same time, uh, once they enter the, the theater, they have the, the, um, they have the liberty to press a bell and then we will skip to the next song. So, so the, the performance can be fast forward to the next, to the next one, to the next one. So actually, once you press, when, once you flip the channel, once you go forward, like how you do with, uh, with your iPod, the show will be shorter, right? Once you go forward. And then we'll go on repeat and repeat and repeat until the 70 minutes is gone. So actually the audience are experiencing the, the performance um, very differently in each show. So one, as long as one person press the bell um, individually, the whole show will be changed for, for the whole audience collectively. So this is um, also how we, how we see performance in, in terms of we usually have to follow a, a length of time, how we are presented. But then at the same time, the audience now can take control to a certain extent. Mm. Last time we chat, we talk about how most of your performance pieces are very interactive. It requires the audience to be um, a active participant of the, of the performance itself. And I was just wondering if this is a way to understand your discussion in terms of identity and the way you, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think about um, how, how we see things, how we experience things. And um, no matter it is in, in the theater or in a gallery space, whether you're watching a performance or you're watching an artwork, there is a relationship. And also there is a kind of like a, a, a social contract in certain of kind of space that you behave in a certain way. And I find that connection um, very important. Even when I curate uh, an exhibition, I think about the space a lot, how people enter, how they experience, how they sense different things. Just like I, 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 I go, to, go to a club to dance. Yeah, I move as I like, but then at the same time, the music has, has an impact on me, the lighting would have an impact of, on me, just as how you go into an exhibition, the space, the air, the temperature, the arrangement, ju just the position of different things are, are all very important in, in constructing a journey. Yeah. Well, um, I want to encourage the audience member again to <laughs> Let us know if you are curious to see anything or to ask any questions at this point. Um, Anchi, do you have any questions? You can ask. <laughs> well, if uh, our audience has questions, you can just unmute yourself and uh, you know even turn on your camera. Or if they are too shy, they can type on the uh, in the chat in the box. Chat, sure, yeah, you can just read a question. We give 10 seconds before I ask <laughs> Enoch a question. You can ask first. Yeah, sure. Then so, because I feel like Enoch, uh, you're very sensitive to all those um, senses, right? And I want to ask like during this lockdown uh, in New York, is there anything you feel like particularly strong about? Or, or let's say after the lockdown, is there any projects or any feelings you? really want to express in, in the upcoming works? Um, I mean, on a daily basis, I, I have to cook yes. at home. 
stay yeah. stable. And also, also to, to keep me stable. Yeah, to keep me mentally stable. Mm -hmm. I try to cook. I love cooking a lot because I can focus. Yeah, I'm always multitasking. So when I cook, I, I try to stay, stay focused um, on that. Um, and also I try my best to, to take a walk every day. Um, in, there is a beautiful park near, near where I live. Um, so I really, really walk, but I, I deliberately won't walk on, on, the, on the grass to, to have a sense of, of the feeling of the grass. Um, also the sun and all that, I, 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 I would go there for the full experience. And, and if there wasn't a lockdown or, or if we go back to normal, I would want to spend more time um, dancing and clubbing, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's, it's very important because I think very differently. Um, so, so I'm also taking all these things in, actually. Um, I wouldn't expect to come to, to, to New York and experience the pandemic, right? Um, so one audience was asking me about a pro uh, the project I'm working on. Um, it, it's not one pro project, but it seems like there are many, many projects coming up um, with, with this idea. Um, I work on a project not because I want to produce, but I work on a project because I, I need to think through something. Um, I'm experiencing the pandemic now, but I began my residency at the American Museum of Natural History. So, so to think about natural history, um, viruses, and also to think about anthropology, about the history of human. So I'm actually thinking about um, the mask in particular as an object, um, as an object of dealing with air and the respiratory system um, in terms of human history or evolution history, or also about how we deal with trauma as an object. So I'm thinking through these things. Um, but then initially I was supposed to work on a fashion project um, in, in September. Um, so I may bring this idea about, um, but of course now everything is postponed. So mm -hmm. we'll see next year what will happen. So I'm supposed to think about this idea about garmenting, about what we wear and how we wear actually. So, so I am loosely working on that. We are talking about that. Uh, we have other questions. Yes, one um, is that How's the residency with the Natural History Museum going now that we are all under quarantine? How is, respond how is the museum responding? Mm -hmm. What was the residency like before the quarantine and also would be curious to know how you came up on the half body striped zebra in the first place was it a co coincidence or something um, so the museum is closed now actually um, so in the beginning it was um, my experience was that I, I would go to the museum I, I had my desk in the anthropology department so um, the museum, it's enormous. Just to walk through that can take hours and hours. And I've walked there many, many times and I wouldn't even be able to see everything. But one interesting thing that, that um, actually made me think a lot, it's how they deal with the caption. And one thing that they fascinated me is that um, how they talk about um, zebra, uh, sorry, how they talk about dinosaurs is that they will tell you about uh, um, the history of these dinosaurs, right? But then they will also tell you what they don't know. For example, they, they don't know about the color. And, and they, they will tell you, they will acknowledge the unknown and why, because they have gone extinct and because we haven't had enough data. And then I find it actually very fascinating of addressing what we don't know. And I find this also as a methodology of thinking. Um, but then, of course, it's, it's locked down. Um, it's closed. Um, so everybody works online. But then, like all the museums in America, the, the priority is to think about 
how to open. So they're thinking about how to open. Um, we don't have a date yet, but the other priority, like all the museums in America and in the world, it's how to deal with finance, how to deal with money, how to finance the, the organization um, with the staff. And I also find this actually very fascinating for me to see as a semi-outsider. So now we are doing everything online. I still talk to my colleagues online. Um, how did I come across um, the, the half stripes zebra? Um, I went back to Hong Kong 20 years ago um, from South Africa to Hong Kong and it took me 20 years to go back. And this time when I went back, um, my family members um, haven't seen me for like 20 years, right? And then they, they always asked, and, and they knew that I had to do a project. And there is no way that they would understand what I was thinking, like, like, like how we were talking, right? So I had to talk to them and just say, just, just take me to places. Just take me to different places. So I had to think about different places to go. And then I asked them, oh, let's go to the Natural History Museum. Then I started to look into different things online and to look at different ideas. And then I started to come across with this zebra, the, the quaha story. And then to look at this idea about um, the return of the zebra. So it was by coincidence. And then I was fascinated by it. And then for the past few years, when I was doing my residencies in Europe, I, I would be going to different natural history museums. Yeah. Do we have a last question? Do we have a last question? Yeah, I think that's the last question, right? From the chat box. Maybe I can follow up with the last question to Enoch. Um, <laughs> this is also something that is pointing to the future. Um, to relate back to what you were talking about, um, identity, and we also talk about how in your videos you are using footages that you took in many other places during your traveling and residency program and family visits. Um, I was wondering if you ever thought about doing, I mean, to continue this line of thoughts with video footages and visits in Hong Kong as a Hong Kong artist. So when you are discussing this idea of identity, um, do you see yourself locating, locate yourself in your land? Hong Kong, it's always in my blood, no matter where I am. Um, the way I, I am brought up, it's always in me. But it's also a struggle to live with that. Yeah, so I constantly, and also I'm constantly an outsider somewhere else. When you're outside that you're confronted with different kinds of cultures, right? And it actually makes you question, also reinforce about who you are. At the same time, it makes you challenge who you are, who you could be. And I find this actually a, a, a challenge and also an exercise to constantly think about who I am and where I am. And to, to your question about, about the future, right now I'm very much interested in thinking about the future, future. Um, and I think we are already in, in the future now. Um, since, since the lockdown, we are already in the future. And then that, another kind of new normal, right? Um, how are we experiencing this um, individually, locally, internationally? So I'm thinking about all these, how, how Hong Kong is experiencing this. Um, how, how me being in New York is experiencing this. And now we are Zooming, right? But I was talking to my cousin in South Africa, and then he said, like, they are not able to Zoom that much because the, the, the um, internet is very slow. And for some areas in South Africa, um, the whole family would only share five gigabyte in one month. So imagine that this kind of um, experience under the umbrella term of pandemic, we all, all experience it differently. Um, how are we take it 
to the future. Um, how are we taking our time now? What is wrong with our time? And how can we envision that? And I see ourselves being in the future now. We, we, we can construct this. And this will be, like it or not, um, this will be taken into our memory to, to go ahead into the future to construct our identity as, as global citizens. Yeah, so this is where I am now. <laughs> Thank you, Enoch. Um, so I think um, we're reaching an end to today's visit. Thank you so much, Enoch, for hosting us. Um, Thank you. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> Um, we will publish this video very soon on YouTube and with that video we'll be sharing some of um, Enoch's video works, the link to his video works including the trilogy. So if you're interested in watching some of Enoch's um, videos full length, so please follow us and follow the updates. Um, Angie, do you want to talk about the next visit? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, we're so happy we have the, the very first uh, visit today with Enoch. And uh, this coming Saturday, uh, Hong Kong time, 9 p.m., we're going to um, do our second student visit uh, with artist Wu Jiaru. Um, so we also have our uh, Facebook page ready. Um, we have a lot of Instagram posts, so if you're interested, please join us for our following visits as well. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chi Chan. Thank you, Anki. Thank you, Parify. Thank you, everyone, for coming. See you.